Hello vinyl community. I hope you are all fine and healthy and still in possession of your sanity. At least as much as it's needed to get through the day. And um, I wanted to make another VC video because lately I've been listening to some really amazing music. And uh, I got some pretty cool records. And um, so uh, the desire to share that with you has reached the point where I have to grab the camera. Now the first album I want to show you is uh, from a band that I have been promoting a lot in my VC videos in the last few years. I'm talking about Babazula. Uh, this is their latest release, came out like one or two weeks ago. Um, this is kind of celebrating uh, their 25 years of existence. Believe it or not, time is passing by. Um, the album is called Hai Wang Gibi, and uh, it's a double album, and uh, it's pretty interesting because this is part of a series that is being organized by a uh, label from Netherlands, and uh, the series is all about um, live recordings that are cut direct to disc. So. Basically, they invite a band like that into the studio with uh, their gear and their program and uh, they record kind of directly into a master lacquer disc um, from which then uh, these uh, albums derive. And um, yeah, um, so this sounds really beautiful, uh, but at the same time it's kind of interesting because uh, you get this mixture of two worlds. On the one hand, you get to hear how Babazula kind of sound live. I mean, they are, I mean, some people will say they are foremost a live band. And at the same time, it comes in this beautiful high-end recording studio quality. So this is pretty exciting. Um, this is also a nicely done release, uh, coming in a gatefold sleeve with uh, some really nice pictures. Uh, also, got here the, these inner sleeves. Um, here in this recording, they basically appear as a four piece. You have uh, Osman Murat Ertel playing his uh, electric saz. Um, now he's by now he's pretty much a uh, kind of journeyman artist in demand because he keeps appearing on other people's recordings because people really kind of took notice of his uh, quite unique uh, electric sus sound this kind of a psychedelic Anatolian rock sound he has kind of very fuzzy very psychedelic um, the other, the other central member of the band is uh, Mehmet Levent Akman, this guy. Um, he's kind of an interesting character as far as band dynamics go, because he is uh, usually, like in a concert, he's sitting in the back, and uh, he has a bass drum that he plays, a kick drum, and uh, he's playing cymbals only. So he has no snare drum, no toms, only cymbals and a bass drum. And in the middle he has this kind of uh, electronic unit that is more like a synthesizer, a sound effect machine with big buttons. And um, the reason why he has no snare drum or, or any kind of toms is because uh, there is Unit Adakale who is playing the Darbuka. So Babazula always had a Darbuka player which is kind of generating this uh, middle, mid-level main rhythm of the music and uh, this is perfectly complementary with uh, Levent's uh, playing of, of cymbals and a bass drum. So it's a kind of interesting way to set up the rhythm section of a band but um, it sounds really great and um, he's also a accomplished spoon player. Now this may sound maybe little funnier than it actually is but if you listen to the recordings how they kind of appropriate spoon playing um, it's 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 really perfect I mean it's really a kind of great rhythm section they have and uh, on this record they also have uh, Periklis Tsukalas which is a Greek uh, oud player and he plays an electric oud from what I've heard a one that he built himself 
And uh, this an oud is usually sort of this traditional Mediterranean instrument that you will probably hear in traditional music of uh, of the Levante the, or, or, or Greece. But um, his electric oud is something completely different. I mean, this instrument has a quite a good range, so some parts are more in the range of a bass guitar. But on the other side of the spectrum, it kind of more sounds like a like a Chapman stick of sorts. So this is an interesting uh, lineup, and the whole album has a very intense psychedelic vibe to it, and uh, almost every side of this double album is just one track. So there's a lot of kind of Anatolian psychedelic sauce going on there. Um, so yeah, get the bong from the cupboard because this is the, exactly the kind of music. And um, it's super interesting because uh, their previous album Derin Derin is more like this typical studio project with really kind of intricate electronic experiments and kind of eclectic exploration of sounds. But here this is uh, much closer to a kind of a live Babazula sound, which is kind of very psychedelic and very jammy with these long solos and all kind of improvisations. So yeah, it's a great record. If you consider to check Babazula out, this is not the worst album to kind of enter this band. Um, it's certainly a album that reflects only a certain side of their style, but nevertheless an important one. So this is Haiwan Gibi by Babazula. Came out uh, this year on the Night Dreamer label together with Gulbaba Records. And uh, it's a quite a cool album. And obviously I will cut out all the boring parts when I put sleeves on records. Now the next album, also rather a new release that came out probably one or two months ago. Amazing, amazing. This is the new album by Kutiman called Wachaga. Kutiman is certainly my favorite artist from Israel. Although this could kind of suggest that there are many bands or artists from Israel that I know, which I don't. But uh, nevertheless, uh, he is certainly uh, my favorite. And this is his fourth album that came out this year, as I said. And um, yeah, this is super interesting. Um, so this is basically his album about Africa. And uh, it's uh, foremost, it's a... I would call it a jazz album, very modern jazz album, uh, very in the vibe of dub music and kind of psychedelic jazz funk. It's a term that I just made up a while ago and I'm probably the only one who's using it. Um, I mean, it's interesting how this album is produced and how it sounds when I heard it for the first time. I felt like uh, this. I had to think of Laszlo Hortobágy. Laszlo Hortobágy is this Hungarian uh, composer and producer that makes this kind of a uh, futuristic uh, Hindustani Middle Eastern music. And I remember back in the day, in the early '90s, when I was listening to Laszlo Hortobágy, I was always wondering, I, how does he do that? I mean, how does he get all these sounds and all these people together for these rather bombastic productions? After I realized that what he does is basically uh, pillaging uh, library records with decades old recordings of uh, certain folklore music and all kind of stuff that he then appropriates um, in forms of samples with his own music, uh, which is still a hell of a job, particularly if you regard that uh, Laszlo Hortobay is starting to do this in the late 80s, early 90s. So. Back in the day, it was not just uh, throwing stuff uh, onto your sequencer timeline. Um, you had to be really good with stuff like um, Akai 10,000. Does anybody remember Akai 10,000? Remember this jog wheel? Yeah, those were the days. Um, but um, then I realized that the story of this album is completely different. So. Uh, Kutiman actually really went to Tanzania and he had a project at hand, which was some kind of a multimedia project that uh, involved uh, the traditional music of the Vachaga peoples 
And uh, while he spent some time there recording all these beautiful female choirs and these uh, vocal ensembles, he probably quickly realized that he has a uh, kind of very potent material at his hand and uh, that this could be a really good album. So when he got back uh, to Tel Aviv, he started to work on this and uh, this is uh, what came out of it. Now the sound of these vocal groups is really great and it has a kind of nice timbre to it. It's not like something you record on a stage in a, in a concert hall, it sounds more like being recorded in a, in a tent or under a tarp somewhere, uh, you know, in a, in a small city or village or maybe in a kind of a local small studio. So it has a certain interesting substance to it and uh, at, the same, at the same time um, there is this uh, kind of a dub aesthetic to it so the sound is sometimes a little hazy which makes the entire experience somewhat dreamlike. But then again, uh, dream is usually a very apt metaphor for Africa. So I find this kind of artistically and aesthetically very interesting. And uh, there are some really amazing kind of jazz parts in it and jazz harmonies that he kind of assembled around these vocals. It's pretty cool. Some great keyboard sounds, amazing kind of percussions and uh, all nicely mixed with this uh, field, field recording atmosphere. So this came out on a label called Sial. It's in a gatefold sleeve with this really kind of ominous uh, imagery. Uh, it should be noted that Kutiman is also a video artist. So uh, I'm pretty sure he's designing uh, the sleeves of his, of his album all by himself. So this has kind of a, his uh, handwriting all over it. There is a little kind of inlay here with the track names and some more details. Um, yeah, wonderful record. Kind of a good example of modern, almost futuristic jazz with uh, this strong connection to uh, very traditional vocal music of Tanzania. Great one. A really good album. It's quite an adventurous listen. Yeah, with this one I went back in time and uh, this is uh, the album The Watchtower or Pozorova Telna by the Czech or Czechoslovakian band Jazz Q. Now, um, in the early 70s there were basically kind of two dominant uh, prog rock slash jazz fusion bands in Czechoslovakia. One of them was uh, Jazz Q. The other one was Blue Effect. Um, I, I, I will talk about both of them now. Um, first, Jazz Q. This, this came out in 1973. Um, this is a band um, around the keyboard player Martin Kratochvil, um, who, as a matter of fact, uh, actually studied music in Berkeley, Boston in the late 60s, I think. And uh, is an excellent uh, jazz organist and keyboarder. Um, this is a four-piece. Uh, you have uh, Lubos Andrescht playing solo guitar, um, Vladimir Padrunik on bass guitar and Michael Verbovac on drums. And uh, the sound is really amazing. This is kind of a dark atmospheric jazz with all kind of progressive rock type of dark chords. Um, I guess it's jazz fusion, but in parts it's much closer to King Crimson. But again, it's 1973, so um, I mean, this album kind of came up in complete cultural isolation, more or less. It's probably important to see it a little bit in a in a historical context, which is uh, kind of uh, as usual as usual uh, with Czechoslovakia. It's kind of a sad story with uh, a slightly subversive humor to it. Some of you maybe know or even remember, <laughs> even remember. <laughs> that um, in 1968 in Czechoslovakia, which at this point was a rather a hardcore communist country, quite thick under the thumb of the Soviet Union, uh, there was this kind of a effort or try for a regime change and uh, that completely failed. And uh, historically this is being called uh, the Prague Spring. So this is three years before I was born there. And um, maybe some of you 
have seen the the Philip Kaufman movie The Unbearable Lightness of Being which kind of aptly describes this general atmosphere uh, particularly in kind of intellectual and uh, artistic circles. The years after the Prague Spring has been crushed down I usually call it Normalizatze or in English normalization. This is oft often being described as this really kind of a dense, dry, dull decade of the 70s uh, where uh, the, the, the political apparatchiki really stepped hard on particularly artists and uh, people that they regarded as kind of politically uh, not reliable. So uh, it's a it's kind of the era that I grew up as a child uh, that is certainly defined by the lack of uh, interesting music and interesting movies. To some extent, I mean, there is obviously the other way to look at it that uh, oftentimes great things actually do happen in situations defined by strong limitations. So, uh, but the interesting thing is that uh, the communist regime that was really hard in control of any kind of artistic and cultural endeavor, endeavor had big issues with rock and roll music in general. So rock and roll was regarded as a imperialistic style that is weakening the socialist culture. So uh, after 1968 they started to ban rock and roll and pop groups left and right and dozens and dozens of bands have in, in sheer panic started to change their names so uh, it sounds less Americanistic, less transatlantic, less international, uh, less uh, western uh, so uh, there are all kind of all these band changes in those years and many of these bands has, have completely been banned. Also you must understand that in those days you could not just go and release your album. You had to apply for it, uh, then you got your application, then you have to present what you actually want to put out. And uh, then there was kind of a censorship bureau that had to put their stamp on it. So any of these albums had to be pre-approved first. Now uh, the interesting thing is that uh, now these, these these people in these censorship bureaus, generally speaking, they were complete morons. I mean, you could not rise through the ranks of these apparatchiki by being kind of smart, reflected person. So those were a lot of kind of buffoons that had really no clue what they were talking about. But uh, interestingly, the term jazz was regarded as highly positive because in their eyes jazz was the music of the subdued American minority. So being a jazz mu musician in Czechoslovakia, they thought this is an expression of being anti-imperialistic. And the biographies of dozens and dozens and dozens of black American jazz musicians can tell a very big story about all of this. But um, obviously this was heavily politicized in a quite a disgusting way. But when a band like JazzQ came to the censorship bureau, they applied for an album and these guys have been listening to the tapes and they just thought, what is this? I mean, what, what, what kind of music is that? And they said, yeah, this, this is just jazz. This is jazz music. This is jazz fusion. And our name is JazzQ. And uh, so they kind of became, albeit... They were this kind of a highly complex, uh, rather dark, sinister jazz proc outfit. They kind of became one of the leading bands in the proc scene in the early 70s. Well, for one reason, there were not too many left in the game. And also, they had this jazz thing in the name and this really helped them. So that's just a kind of a little detour just to explain how... Uh, what it kind of took to be in a band in this country and in those years. This album here came out in 1973. We have some really nasty solo guitar playing here by Lubos Andrescht. Um, and uh, obviously Martin Kratoch with keyboard playing and kind of organ playing is quite outstanding. This came out on the Panton label. 
And there were basically only two kind of major labels in those days in Czechoslovakia. There was Panton and uh, there was um, Suprafon. Um, yeah, so uh, this is JSQ, Pozorovatelna, in English, The Watchtower. And uh, this is a pretty cool album. Uh, great stuff. Uh, yeah, this is the Panton label here. Yeah, wonderful. Um, yeah, and the other band, because I said there were like two uh, kind of competing uh, jazz fusion prog bands in Prague in those years. The other one was uh, Blue Effect. And Blue Effect, actually in Czech it's Modri Effect, um, they kind of encountered the same uh, problems and the same, uh, they had the same luck because of their jazz affiliation. Which was really ironic because um, well, this is their album Nova Synthesa 2, or New Synthesis 2, that came out in 1974. Now, what I wanted to say is that uh, actually their band name, Modri Effect, which means Blue Effect, is kind of weirdly ironic because uh, is there is a there's, there's a kind of a pun hidden in it. Um, it's a reference to the so-called Blue Book. Now the blue book was a little ID that you could apply for in those days as a young man that confirmed that you are not going to be drafted into the army. So uh, back in those days uh, everybody at the age of 18 had to go to the army for two years. Now one can always make an argument that um, there might be something positive about it when uh, kind of this late teenager uh, gets some lessons in discipline and blah 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 but honestly this was just an epic waste of time and never ever in the history of the Cold War was there a single situation where anybody would want it to rely on the efficiency of the Czechoslovakian army not in a million years so this was just a giant bunch of bullying and really a kind of weird political psychoterror <laughs> thrown at these young men. And uh, so many of them kind of took it as a, kind of wore it as a badge of honor if they managed to get this blue book. And it was not easy to get out of the army in Czechoslovakia, but there was a kind of a procedure or protocol. You have to you had to apply. You needed some stuff from doctors, etc. And some, I mean, particularly almost every member of this band took a bit of a pride <laughs> from the fact that they were never in the army. Uh, so um, interesting group um, around uh, the guitar player Radim Hladik. And um, this is a very interesting album that sounds very different than the previous one I've shown you by uh, Jazz Q. Um, Blue Effect were kind of a more prog, more prog rock band. Actually in parts quite reminiscent of early Uriah Heep maybe. But the thing is this entire record here is recorded with the Jazzovi Orchestr Československého Rozhlasu, which is the jazz orchestra of the Czechoslovakian broadcasting, so basically a a uh, big band orchestra from the Czech radio. And uh, this is an incredible, highly fascinating blend of two styles that probably uh, under more liberal circumstances would have never happened because probably people would say, oh, come on, these two styles just don't gel, forget it. But um, as I said, sometimes limitations can breed interesting results. So this is kind of a weird mixture of this kind of a heavy prog rock sound uh, that at the same time very beautifully <laughs> interacts with this big band jazz rock feeling. It's all very grandiose and very cinematic and adventurous. There are some wonderful brass sections there. Um, the trumpet on this album is being played by Lazzo Deci, who is kind of this uh, Clifford Brown and Miles David disciple, a Slovakian uh, musician who moved to New York in the late 80s, um, who's playing awesome, awesome trumpet here. 
So I guess if you like a band like Uriah Heep, if you like Salisbury and Demons and Wizards by Uriah Heep, you could like this one, but at the same time you get these really lengthy parts that sound like a movie soundtrack and all kind of hard bop passages in between. It's quite incredible. So it's a very unique album and uh, quite fascinating and um, it's the right kind of record to listen to in your headphones when you are driving on a train or on a bus because uh, it's quite adventurous. really like it. Yeah, so uh, it's rather rare that I show something from Czechoslovakia or from Czech Republic. And even though it's my home country, it's just that I rarely find something from Czechia that I that really tickles me. So uh, what else? Oh yes, this one you probably know or maybe not. Uh, this is an album that uh, was first released in Belgium in 1975. This is uh, Funky Tramway by Mad Unity, which basically is Janko Nilovic. Janko Nilovic is a jazz and jazz funk producer and composer originally from Montenegro. Uh, I think with one of his parents is Greek who moved uh, to France probably in the 60s and uh, became a well-established uh, jazz and jazz funk artist there. And um, he's a keyboarder, he's a composer, producer, pianist. Um, but this is a, it's an incredible record. I mean, this sounds great. This is a reissue by an, on a label called Underdog. Um, this originally um, came out on uh, a label called Vogue in Brussels in Belgium. The entire album kind of reflects upon the jazz fusion scene in Belgium in those years. And uh, it's not only feverish funk rhythms and stuff like that. There are these amazing kind of atmospheric jazz ballads, like the second track called Flemish Sweet. Very wonderful. It's a great album. Some great bass playing by Pino Marchese. Uh, excellent stuff. And uh, if you like 70s jazz funk, then uh, you may enjoy this one. Funky Tramway by Mad Unity, aka Janko Nilovic. How do you like the record so far? I know I'm talking a lot this time, but um, I felt like these records can use some context. Um, which leads us to this next album. A strong change in style, but uh, this is a amazing one. This is uh, White Shadows in the South Seas by Mike Cooper. Now, first of all, I got this album because I have seen it somewhere on in a VC, in a vinyl community video, probably a month ago, maybe two months ago, I don't know. It just bugs me that I forgot where I have seen it. I even went so far to go into my uh, YouTube uh, history and uh, I spent going like 40 minutes through at least 25 uh, VC videos that I had seen, kind of hoping that it will pop up somewhere, but I have not found it. I don't know where, I don't know who, have sh who has shown this before, but uh, this is where I got it from. So I would have loved to make a little shout out but uh, I'm just too empty-headed for that, <laughs> obviously. But I, I have to start to make some notes, uh, just uh, because uh, it's such a shame that I always forget uh, which VC member inspired me to a particular album. Yeah, so um, Mike Cooper. Mike Cooper is a uh, English guitarist and um, mostly in the area of blues or I think more like country blues with a lot of elements of kind of jazz and calypso, but particularly into Hawaiian guitars. Um, so I think he felt connected to the music of the Pacific and the Polynesian music for a very long time. Uh, his, his career started in 1965, I think. Um, so here is someone who is basically reinventing himself for decades. And this record is kind of a beast of its own. I and mean, the title the title of the album is based on a book by uh, Frederick O'Brien who was this uh, kind of south 
Pacific uh, oriented uh, traveler who wrote this book around 1920 I think and it was made into a silent movie um, back in the day and um, yeah this is a double album first of all this has become at least for now this is probably my favorite album cover it's just this kind of a old wood cutting is just uh, marvelous I mean the atmosphere of this picture it's incredible it's really amazing certainly something I would kind of like to see framed um, ironically this this is a re-release that came out in 2015 it was first released on CD in 2013 and uh, with a different cover with a cover that's uh, definitely not as good as this one I mean this this is wonderful so uh, what is the music about? Um, the music is a... Um, it certainly goes beyond the term ambient. Um, we can't always use the word ambient whenever we don't know what to say about something being kind of spheric or atmospheric. Uh, actually the, the, this, the description of ambient, the way that uh, Brian Eno describes it in his manifesto, on the record sleeve of music for airports is a rather precise description of the matter so it's actually not supposed to be uh, the term is not supposed to be used in such a in such a loose way as we usually all do it so i for me this feels much more like kind of a fourth world music in the way that john hassel coined the term uh, you have kind of a lot of elements of down tempo in it and all kind of electronic sampling and looped music uh, a lot of abstract guitar playing but at the heart of the entire project are these amazing field recordings so uh, usually you have this beautiful kind of field recording of a certain atmosphere and then the music slowly creeps in brilliant brilliant this is a very atmospheric album uh, that's uh, quite enjoyable and uh, you can listen to this any time of the day but uh, still I would like to know uh, who suggested this record to me first through his or her VC video but who knows maybe you are watching right now then you can uh, let me know <laughs> so this is uh, White Shadows in the South Seas from 2013 by Mike Cooper in a re-release on vinyl 2015 on a label called Sacred Summits which is a pretty good name for a label now the next album is a very different artist, very different uh, style of music and yet in a strange way it feels very complementary uh, to the Mike Cooper album that I've shown you before. Um, this is a record by Efrain Rosas called I Enjoy the World and uh, Efrain Rosas is an artist from Peru but he often recorded music in New York like this album has been entirely recorded in New York uh, he's also the front the frontman of a uh, Brooklyn based band called La Mecanica Popular um, this was first released in 2017 in Peru as a tape uh, as an MC and uh, this is a re-release from 2019 on vinyl for the first time by a Dutch label called uh, Futura Resistenza and um, this is kind of a minimal electronic album with a lot of ambient and a lot of fourth world feeling to it uh, it's strangely exotic by using all kind of tribal sounds and a lot of field recordings again um, it feels very timeless in a way it kind of connects the very old and the very new it is somewhat avant-gardistic in parts and very experimental but it has all these kind of Latin moments in and there is also a track with this kind of archaic flute uh, which always makes great ambient it's almost, it's almost like it's exploring the music of the Stone Age uh, the dawn of humanity and stuff like that so it's very abstract in parts but always very pleasant to listen which is kind of cool because um, I guess everyone perceives this album probably very differently but it has a very good flow and it's kind of the perfect album to put on while you are working for example because uh, it's it's a great listen but uh, you don't need to pay 
attention the entire time, non-stop. This is a very fascinating album and uh, with some uh, slightly uninspired <laughs> inner labels. And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the whole design of the album is all very kind of frugal, frugal. Um, but uh, the music is very intriguing and uh, quite enjoyable. So uh, it kind of makes a good double feature uh, with the Mike Cooper album. And uh, finally, my last record for today is this one. This is Uprising by Miles Mosley. Now Miles Mosley is the upright bass player from uh, Kamazi, Washington. Uh, he's uh, from California, actually from Hollywood. And um, yeah, you have the entire Kamazi Washington gang playing here. It kind of <laughs> it kind of reminds me of the good old days of Parliament and Funkadelic uh, when uh, George Clinton kind of had this strategy to to saturate the funk market uh, with their material. So basically, everyone in the band started started to put out these solo albums. But um, if you looked at the lineups, it was <laughs> been always the same guys. Everywhere was Bernie Worrell on keyboards and. So um, that's why uh, getting a kind of complete uh, Parliament Funkadelic uh, discographies today is a pretty big task to get all these little branches. I don't know if that's what's going on here. Um, Miles Mosley's album is quite amazing. Uh, it's more in a direction of jazz rock and uh, with a lot of funk and fusion, but all kind of uh, classical elements also. Um, and as I said, you have basically the the same lineup that you would have on a Kamazi Washington album. You have Cameron Graves and Brandon Coleman on piano and keyboards, Tony Austin on drums, Ryan Porter um, on trombone and Kamazi Washington obviously on uh, saxophone. Yeah, it's a brilliant sounding album. I mean, it's probably not a stretch to say that, that Miles Mosley right now is the most uh, spectacular upright bass player. He's certainly the most uh, versatile, uh, using all kind of effect gadgets and uh, sometimes you just listen to what he's playing and you just, just wonder in awe because you kind of didn't know that this kind of sound can be created with a contrabass. So, uh, with the double bass, so um, yeah, um, quite incredible. It's a cool album. Um, it's a nice addition to my Kamazi Washington records, but as far as style goes, it's much more rockier. It's much more, there's much more of a pop aesthetic to it. But at the same time, it's quite playful and rather sophisticated in composition and touching upon all kind of different styles. Um, but generally, I would call it a jazz rock or jazz funk album. But um, as usual, uh, words uh, oftentimes are not enough to describe music. So that's Uprising by Miles Mosley from the year 2017. Came out on Verve. As you can see here, Verve. Verve. So, and that's it for now. I take a sip of coffee. Uh, And um, do something else. So um, I hope uh, you, um, you have enjoyed this. And this was kind of in interesting or informative in some way. And um, maybe there was some stuff there that you want to check out. So keep it spinning. Till next time. Goodbye.